Okay, so I'm from Grey Innovation. It's a company I started uh, 15 years ago as an electrical engineer that thought this doesn't pay very well. I spent a year at Bosch and uh, you know, I enjoyed it, but uh, I think I nearly cried on the first day when I saw a car park. I mean, it's not a place to get rich. And uh, so what can I do? So actually, I got into medical devices. While I was at uni, in my final year project, I did a medical device. I figured if there's any way to make some money and, and do something good and find that synergy, oh, you love it, um, between engineering and other fun things and other important things, medical devices would be a really good thing to do. And look, it's worked out all right, I'm still here. So I'm just gonna start off with a little story or a, a case study on Parkinson's disease. So I think this is a really good example of how a simple medical device coupled with um, you know, an information system behind it can make a big difference. So Parkinson's is a big problem. It affects uh, about 7 million people globally, probably more. Uh, it's been treated with drugs. You know, it's, a, it's a pharmaceutical only intervention, as right now many things are. And that's the really cool thing about this point in time, it's shifting. So this is one of the, the first projects we did in, in getting into um, an intervention that's been solved with a pill up until now and looking at what can we do with a device? What, what difference would that make? So one of the uh, big problems in Parkinson's is that the, the drugs used are very toxic. They only five to 10% to of L-DOPA crosses the blood brain barrier. The rest of it's metabolized. Now, five to 10%, that's by the half or double your dosage. And the metabolic rate varies between patients. Now, so it varies between the same patient, depending on what they're doing. I mean, it's a, these are pretty rubbery numbers. As an engineer, I was like, look, it's gonna be you know, you know, three or four, six meters, but it's okay, I, you know, I wouldn't be doing very well. So there's a, a very individual component to how Parkinson's patients uh, respond to that medication. And, and it's a very fast moving condition. So you have to go back to your, your clinician uh, really uh, every, every month to be reassessed. And, uh, and to make sure that that dosage is right. And, they, uh, and you know, the, the assessment is just crazy. I'll tell you about it. So, you know, Parkinson's sufferers often have other complications. Dementia is a common one. And so the assessment goes something like, you know, I'm gonna get you out of your retirement village um, and make you catch the tram in, in you know, peak hour traffic and sit in the waiting room. You're already anxious. You can't remember what you had for breakfast. And I'm gonna spend five minutes interviewing you and you're going to tell me about your month and how you felt and what you can remember about all these episodes. And from that, they'll make a very drastic sort of set of decisions uh, in relation to how much they'll dope they'll feed you, which you know, will kill you over time. So it's pretty rubbish. You know, so the, the problem with assessing Parkinson's is, is the, the clinician has no idea of what's going on um, with the patient at home. They can only ask them what's going on when they're uh, in for an assessment. But when they're in for that assessment, they're not themselves. They're very active getting them in. Um, you know, it's the whole Schrodinger's cat thing. You know, it really interfered with the headspace of that patient. Um, the <coughs> compliance, the, the, uh, the, the, um, the compliance with medication is just so important. You have to take that medication when you're meant to. But these people have dementia, so there's a compliance issue. Um, and they can't really articulate very well how they're feeling and so on. So there's all these sorts of issues. As a result, poorly dosed and uh, the consequence for the patient is a lack of mobility, um, uh, increasing morbid morbidity, and it's just, it's a very bad outcome for them. And I just hit the wrong key. Maybe I've got it. There we go, that's a good sign. Right, sorry folks. Okay, so look, in, uh, in six months we developed a, a simple device. It's just an accelerometer, really and it logs body tremor. That's all it does. As an engineering exercise, it's pretty basic. If I'd done it for a final year project, it might have got 80%. Now inside, what, it's sending that data and it's, it's putting it through a pretty interesting algorithm that was developed at the Flory Institute over quite a number of years. That's very cool. So what, what we're able to do is take this tremor information that the patient wears 24 seven for a week. So we've gone from a five minute assessment for an agitated patient to a 24-7 baseline, measured 200 times a second. 
And what, what we're able to do for the very first time is actually graph what Parkinson's looks like over time. So these are the two clinical parameters of Parkinson's, dyskinesia and bradykinesia. And you know, we've seen graphs that are just <coughs> so peaky, it looks like sort of Richter scale stuff. And those peaks are when the patient is most agitated, when they're being assessed. So you know, we can really see now what their, what their average looks like, what their baseline looks like, and what the right medication is when they're really themselves. And that's, that's very important. And down the bottom here, we have medication times, because we've got a very simple system in there to um, alert the patient, to remind them to take the medication, and for them to feed back that they've taken it. So it's really, and it's a $50 device. Um, it's launched in uh, the UK. It's reimbursed under the national health system. It's the sort of thing that will be um, probably sold to Medtronic for a billion dollars. And unfortunately, we don't have any equity. But anyway, we changed the model <laughs> after that. So to me, that's a, a good example of what we're in now, which is the digital healthcare revolution. It's looking at um, technology, devices, information systems, Interfe intervening in a very old model of a pharmacy-only approach to things. And uh, you can see the investment stats. I mean, they're going through the roof. The, the numbers are sort of almost doubling in terms of VC funding year on year for this space. The top performing ASX stock right now is a, um, a medical device startup called Isonia. It's simply a glorified microphone that measures uh, your wheeze puts it through a very complex algorithm in the cloud and sends a report to the clinician so they can help assess that you're taking medication and uh, that you're taking it when you need to take it. As a device, it's not that complex, but the impact, the health impact is phenomenal. And the value attributed to that company is also very high as a result. Now, for me as a device developer, the area that I'm most interested in in uh, digital healthcare is what they call mobile healthcare. So I'm just going to talk about that. Um, and what, what really is it? And it's a few things, it's not sort of hard and fast, but we're looking at devices which are, you know, they're, they're continually monitoring and really anything that can be monitored. The more the better because you can put these, these uh, output from sensors into some crazy algorithm and you can start to tell um, not just the simple things like blood pressure, but if you're, if you're looking at understanding someone's movement, you know, uh, if you know that you know, this uh, grandmother gets up and does her thing in the morning and one morning she's not doing it or she's doing it half an hour later, that, that might be significant. Or certainly if there's a trend there, that might be significant. So it's not always obvious what we want to sense. The interesting thing is that uh, there are new sensors coming online all the time. You know, sensors that can <coughs> bind a protein to something and, uh, and register uh, electrically, which is what we need to pick it up. So it's a really dynamic space. The, the word smart is used a lot, you know, smart devices, um, you know, we've got to analyse the data. It's not just about um, measuring, it's, it's, it's analysing it, it's informing the patient and the clinician and, uh, you know, communicating back to some cloud-based system, getting into the healthcare, uh, the e-health environment, which is, I think, where a number of people here are looking. So where that data is coming from in the first instance is sort of this, this smart device. And that device might have a really cool interface. Uh, it might have no interface whatsoever because the patients uh, won't understand it or they, they, they have dementia or whatever. So it's, you know, we've got to get that right. And remote, remote care is, of course, a big uh, benefit to this sort of technology as well. And the thing that uh, healthcare providers and insurers like about it is it it's offers a, a level of personalization. So you can start to personalize the healthcare um, treatment on a patient by patient basis. And that's really not possible under the old pharmaceutical model. Uh, yeah, so it, these devices, these smart devices essentially deliver more function, more efficacy. Like the Parkinson's monitor, it's, it's doing a lot more than the existing approach and the outcome is a lot more effective for the patient. And we're empowering the patient, giving them that information and letting them you know, potentially modify their own lifestyle. Um, and that's a big thing too. So it's not like the old days where you go to the doctor, they pat you on the back, give you two pills and, and that's it. You know, the insurers, the government want you, want the patient to be involved in what's going on. And you know, you can't do that with the pill. Now the numbers in this space are big. I um, mean, they're really big. And this is what I mean, I, I never dreamed they'd be this big when we started trying to get into it years ago. 
Uh, but if you, you compare these numbers to, say, automotive industry numbers here, you know, this is where I'd be putting my money. And mobile health apps are, are really uh, a, a very hot space as long as you combine it with a device. There's a very interesting trend, and this is a very important trend, and it's not really well understood as to how this is going to play out, but it's a shift away from a traditional medical device into something that's more like a consumer product that has some sort of um, therapeutic benefit. So the Fitbit from Nike is a good example of that. It's not a medical device. You can just go and buy it anywhere in a sports shop. But it, it has some health outcomes. We're seeing a, a number of uh, strategies around the technology we're developing where we've agreed with the investors uh, that we're not going to do a medical device. We could, we could you know, turn it into a class one or class two device, but we're going to make it a consumer device. And that, that solves a whole lot of problems. And I mentioned before about these smart sensors uh, and the, the, the novel sensors coming out. The, 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 there's a lot of uh, information that's saying that we're going to be wired up like, you know, God knows what in, in the future and we'll be sensing all sorts of things all the time. And, you know, if you've got diabetes, you want that. If you've got a condition that's really difficult to manage, you, you want that. It's the difference between life and death sometimes. So mobile health isn't about just the device. I'm mean, a really engineeringly complex diagram here, but you know the device is up there with the little patient hand. It's the Parkinson's watch. Um, you know we're getting data off that. We're talking to um, the clinician through some sort of interface for the clinician. We're sending data back through the cloud to a server where it's being analysed. Reports are being generated in a language that clinicians understand. It's very important to have this combination of, of medicos and industrial designers and software people and engineers all working together to sort of get this right. Uh, you know, you're doing analysis that might come out of a research program from a university and it's got a component of billing and e-health interface. So, you know, these are, these are complex things. The device might be simple, but by the time you actually build a business, you really need to partner up and and get quite a few skill sets around the table. Uh, as I mentioned before, that you know, th this is really about um, customising healthcare and letting the patients um, be a part of that process to allow them to modify their own behaviour. I mean, that's at the end of the day, you know, you can eat pizza and take pills, but you know, if something's going to tell you to eat less pizza, it's a good thing. And you know, this space allows small companies to play. I mean, we're not a big company and we've done uh, maybe 15 of these devices and most of those are in the market. Uh, it's, anyone in here can get into this as long as you, you know, take a reasonable approach and build a good team. And the whole thing uh, comes back to this you know, smartphone. So you can talk to a smartphone very easily. That takes a lot of the commercialisation, a lot of the engineering and complexity out of it. And, uh, that's what's got investors excited too. That's a really hot space. And the other, of course, with everyone doing this and sending their data back, you get a tremendous baseline for, for data. We we're doing a project at the moment looking at measuring where kids sit on the autism spectrum, which is you know, a pretty, uh, pretty amazing thing to do. If we can do it, we'll be very, very happy. It's a, it's a very subjective test at the moment. And, the only way we can do it is by having an enormous amount of data. So, you know, tens of thousands or, or hundreds of thousands potentially one day of, of children. So we know what normal is and what normal isn't and how normal is changing over time too. That's it. It's just beginning. You know, that's, that's why they call it a revolution. Um, so, you know, I thought I'd talk about how you get into it or if you're in it, you know, we're in it, but what, what do we see as the challenges and opportunities? Uh, look, the, the big thing is that it's a complex puzzle. It's not like the old linear days of uh, having a, a, a device and trying to commercialise it with the skill set you've got, contracting in a few people. You've really got to have a partnership approach. Uh, my view is you treat it more as an engineering project drawing into research rather than a research project contracting engineers. Um, so the, the existing R&D model of commercialising I don't think works in this space. It's too complex, there's too many players, 240 patents in an iPhone. You know, there's just so much going into devices that you've got to build a team or a group of companies, even small companies that, that want to do this and partner and, and do it. But it, you know, the opportunity is strong. There's nine and a half billion spent in research every year in this country, which is, is a staggering amount of money. Um, 
and the research is well regarded. So investors are looking at what we're doing here, and, and uh, you know, if we want to build a device around some interesting work coming out of a university, there is scope to do that. The universities are uh, being told to work with SMEs more and more, so that's that's a great thing. You couldn't do that five years ago. And just walk into a university, they'd they'd laugh because they want to do a deal for IBM for a dollar rather than do, do a deal with an SME for you know, $10,000 because IBM's got a really cool logo. But that's changing. Mining boom's winding up, investors are moving on. You know, it's a good time, it really is a good time. Uh, but I think if there's one thing you know, I, I could say that's worked well for us, it's just partnering with other players in industry, with government and um, with research. You don't have to you know, have everyone around the table, but they're all trying to help, they're all trying to make it happen. Just a little bit about uh, what we're up to. So, you know, these are some technologies we're working on. This is a, uh, a research out of Monash. Uh, it's a, a, a smart inhaler where you can actually adjust the droplet size of the nebulant. So 20% of asthmatics can't use a, a normal ventilator inhaler just because the droplet size doesn't suit their lungs. So with this, you can dial up your droplet size. You can monitor your um, compliance and all the things that I spoke about before. Um, and we got some money out of the Vic government under the health market validation program for that. So we're bringing in the, the government investor or grant money and the um, university. Uh, we're doing some more work in body tremor, this time not for Parkinson's but for diabetes, looking at the physiological response to low blood sugar, hypoglycemia. And uh, that's a big issue when you're in your sleep, you uh, don't wake up one of these hypo events and they're very common and uh, they can be fatal. If not fatal, they can really yeah, do a lot of damage to you. And so it's a big fear of diabetics having this nighttime hypo. So you know, the, the aim is to address it with this technology. And it was IP out of, a, um, out of the Royal Adelaide Hospital. So you know, we, we got some money out of the South Australian government to help work that up. So again, everyone's trying to, to make this happen if you can pitch a good story. Uh, the bionic eye, you know, I never thought it would be, we actually, we do a cortical implant, so we, um, not in our lab, but we take, uh, do a craniotomy and uh, implant up to 10 uh, autonomous electro tiles that have 45 electrodes each and they penetrate into the visual cortex. So I never thought, while I was sitting at Bosch in the car park looking at all the crap cars, that we'd be soaring the back off people's heads, but there we go. <laughs> so. And some wearable electronics. Uh, this is pretty interesting. Again, uh, we're, we're told best in class uh, for measuring body motion. So this is used by the Premier League football clubs in the, in the UK and Europe, but also the football teams here. The big application though is OHS. So if you hurt your back at the moment, the best that can be done is to stick uh, some tape on your back. That's what the physio will do. And if you move and you feel the tape pull, you're meant to stop doing what you're doing. It's pretty archaic. For a society that put someone on the moon, you know, 50 years ago, it's poor. So we, we thought, you know, we'd uh, do something better than that. So you wear these devices, they stick on your back, you can wear them all day, and uh, they transmit and log all your movements as well as alert you to anything you're doing you're not meant to do. Um, and at the end of the day, your physio gets a report, so he can call you up and say, Jefferson, you're still, you know, you did a really bad lift when you pulled that keg off your truck at 2.33 yesterday. What did I tell you? Come in, we're going to practice it again. You know, no, all right, fine. So it's that compliance. All this great technology, um, what you need is money. So the other thing we're doing is putting together a venture capital fund and a philanthropic foundation. So we're going after these sources of money that have gone through a, a traditional model, the old model of R&D, where you fund sort of from the lab and you work out. We're saying, no, we're going to we've got an infrastructure in place of 35 engineers, 20 commercial guys, we're going to fund that to go into the lab, be into multiple labs, we're going to find the bits of research wherever they're hiding and combine that with all the background IP we've got in our engineering world and all the partnerships we have, we'll fund that and uh, see how that goes. I think it's going to make a significant difference to the track record of investing in early stage technologies. So that's, that's me, that's what I've been up to. Thank you. So Chris defined the topic to me tonight as digital health innovation system, ecosystems locally and abroad. 
So I can speak to that from two angles. The first is as someone who went through a health tech incubator and so theoretically is part of a digital health innovation ecosystem right now, but also as a mentor and investor in Startmate, which is one of the incubators here in Australia. So seeing both from the bottom up what it's like to be a founder in these incubators and then from the top down helping other startups. So from those vantage points, um, I guess I've seen really crystal, with crystal clarity, just how valuable they can be. Um, and also the value of having a health specific incubator or a health specific community. Um, so I have a couple of minutes tonight and I'm going to cover two things. First is how we got into Rock Health as an Australian startup, a couple of guys from Queensland who didn't know too much. And second, how Rock Health has been valuable to me and what that might mean for this community and the Australian digital health community. So we were part of Rock Health's second class. Um, there's been five Rock Health classes now and according to the angel list statistics, uh, Rock Health companies have the third highest average valuation of any incubator, which is $5.2 million. Uh, I would like to say we would value that that much, but I would be lying. So Rock Health companies have raised about $50 million today but it's safe to say that it's the most competitive and well-respected health technology incubator in the world. So I was in introduced to the CEO, uh, Hallie Teco, who was the founder of Rock Health when she was still at business school in 2011. I was introduced by a friend. Oh, someone's calling on Skype. Um, I was introduced by a friend of hers, and uh, it was a project she was starting in one of her classes. So at around that same time, I went to the US and I was trying to raise funding for my first startup, which I'd pitched as Meetup meets Foursquare for Exercise. So after two months of pitching that, I uh, was nowhere. I'd raised zero dollars. And the team split up, and I came home to Australia with my tail between my legs, wondering what the hell I was going to do. So after many long and sad walks along the beach, uh, I went home one day, and out of the blue, Hallie had sent me an email asking me if I still wanted to apply. So I wrote back and I said, yeah, I'd love to, but just want to be clear, I have no team, no skills, and not real high on confidence right now. Um, but I think she appreciated the honesty and uh, we got an interview. So by the time the interview rolled around, it was late December, and I just decided I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to be a part of it. And uh, my now wife, who's here tonight, and I had been doing long distance for three years, commuting between New York and Adelaide. And we said, you know what, it's been enough, let's, um, let's call it off. Let's no, no more long distance, let's just, I'm going to stay in Australia. I'd also found a developer remotely who I'd been working with, but I'd never met him, and I thought, you know what, this is just not worth the risk. So as a result, I went into the interview pretty fearless. Uh, Julia will, who will remember uh, that we were sitting in the front of her dad's car with a Telstra dongle. Uh, I was in my board shorts, and I started my pitch by saying, let me tell you why you shouldn't accept us. <laughs> So a week later we were notified that we got in. Uh, I called Ben, who I never met at that point, and I said, well, uh, I know we never met, but in two weeks' time, let's move to San Francisco together. Uh, he had no money, so I bought him a one-way plane ticket, bought myself a one-way plane ticket, and the first time we met was in this cafe at the Departures Lounge at the Sydney airport. <laughs> on day one of Rock Health, we walked in, we said, this, this idea that no one funded really is pretty crap, uh, so let's scrap this and do something new. And now we're still alive two, two years later with great investors and a randomized control trial in the Mayo Clinic and we fight on day by day. So my surefire recipe for success in applying to incubators is be extremely honest, extremely lucky and have good friends. Fortunately, uh, I have a better plan than that now and I've become much better at helping other teams apply and get into Rock Health. I was on the selection panel last year. Uh, so this is my email and my address, my phone number. If I can help you in any way, uh, please be in contact, um, and I'll put that up a little later so you, if you didn't get it down then. So the second thing I want to talk to, uh, to tonight is uh, what was valuable, valuable about being in Rock Health, and the answer comes in three parts. So the first and the largest component of the value of Rock Health is the relationships that I developed during that time with other startup founders who work in healthcare. So whether it was insurance or HIPAA or fundraising or hiring or firing or employee equity or any other area of startup life, it was almost certain that another Rock Health founder knew how to solve my problem and was willing to get on the phone with me and talk me through it. When we went to fundraise again earlier this year, about three quarters of my introductions to investors came from Rock Health founders who'd already raised money from them. So we got to speak to Sequoia and Kleiner and True Ventures and Coastler and Floodgate 
the list was really long and all of them took the meeting because they came from a Rock Health founder they trusted. We had Rock Health's chief strategy officer help us write out our five year P&L and help us challenge really our assumptions for our growth. So the power of that network is strong and it's real and it gets stronger with time. The second value was that Rock Health is a really powerful platform to partner with other organizations. So if we were a dinky three-person startup from Brisbane, we wouldn't have a snowflake's chance in hell of getting through the door at the Mayo Clinic. But Rock Health allowed us to do that. It connected us with their innovation center directly. We had a pilot with Genentech. We got a deal with one of the four big startup law firms in San Francisco. We saw the Clinton Foundation, Kaiser Permanente, the Harvard Medical School, UCSF, and on and on. It's really great that uh, thing that we learned was that people answer emails from Rock Health, for, from Rock Health startups. People come to Rock Health to share their wisdom, like Dave Moran, the founder of Path, and our accountant, our insurance broker, our interns, our first employee, all came through, through us, through Rock Health, to us. Rock Health acts like this magnet for people and firms that care about digital health, just like tonight does the same, and that value passes on to everyone else in the system. So thirdly and finally, Rock Health has a demo day, which is an extremely powerful forcing function for execution. So the fear that drives you when you can imagine standing up in front of 300 investors and having nothing to say is incredibly uh, forceful. It makes you ship product, it makes you talk to customers, it forces you to sign deals and get paying customers, and it forces you to think about yourself critically and rationalize your assumptions and address your weaknesses. So you can create external forcing functions without an incubator, but I can say for sure that demo days really work. So that combination, a network, a platform that open doors, and the forcing function of a demo day is a great way, uh, is extremely effective for people starting companies. The other interesting thing is the value of Rock Health I thought would go like this after I left, and in fact it's gone like this, because now there's five times as many people who can help me. Um, and even today, I was able to connect a Melbourne startup that wants to go to Rock Health next year with a team that came uh, two classes after me about how to best structure their application. And that's a favor that I can pull because everyone in Rock Health is incentivized to invest back into the ecosystem. So whether Melbourne has an incubator or not, that basic philosophy of investing back into something bigger than yourself without the need for short-term compensation is what drives great communities. So I'm really excited personally to see that happening here. If I can be helpful to you in any way, please come and ask me. Thanks so much for having me and good luck. Now, if you are a parent of school-aged children, you would be familiar with emergency medical forms. We fill them out constantly. At the start of the school year, you've got to fill out this massive form with all of your emergency contacts, with asthma plans, allergies, medications, you name it, you've got to fill this information in. And guess what? Then they have an excursion, and you've got to fill out again. Then they have another excursion, you fill out again, they go and camp, you fill it out again. It is an absolute nightmare. And it's a nightmare for the school as well, because they have to keep sending these forms out, bugging the parents, um, they have a big problem with uh, chasing up all the forms that don't come back. It's a huge administrative overhead for the schools, uh, as well as the overhead for the parents. Now, what CareMonkey is, is an electronic medical form. So the school can invite all of the parents to fill in this information once, electronically, and then they only need to go back to that form when there's something to change, like a new allergy or a new medication or maybe my mobile phone has changed and you can just make that change and then everybody that's got access to that electronic record is now instantly updated. So that's, that's the idea behind it. So let me give you a, a, a demonstration of the, of the system. There's a few different interfaces for the different users. Here is the interface that a school administrator or, or a club administrator uses. And basically, there's three different areas. At the top, we've got the, the profiles. These are the, the people that we are collecting information for. Now, the ones that are red, that means that the, the parent hasn't entered the information yet. The ones that are blue, uh, that information has been submitted. Okay? Um, the way that we get the information from the parents is we just click this Add, Add button. And there are three different ways to collect the information. One of them is 
um, singularly, one at a time. You, know, you might have a new kid join the school today and uh, you've got to go and collect that. Isn't that, doesn't always happen in a demo. No? There it is. All right, so I can add a single profile request, I can type a list of, of kids, or I can upload a spreadsheet uh, with all the kids, say, in, in one class and, and uh, do that all, all at the same time. So here's, here's an example, if I add a single request, I might have, um, whose profile are you requesting? Jim Smith, who are you requesting it from? It's uh, Jim's mum at gmail.com. Uh, Jim's in grade 2B, so I checked that box. How often do I want to annoy Jim's mum to fill this for me? So <laughs> reminders, I'm going to send a, a reminder every three days until we get it, and then we send the email. And let's hope there's no one with the email address Jim's mum at gmail.com. Because Greg's <laughs> <laughs> got an invite to uh, send your information. <laughs> Okay, so the, and th this is live, by the way. So if there is, it, it really did happen. Right? So uh, that that created another profile. So how do we? Uh, you saw me. I put Jim straight into a into the right class, and th these are the groups. This is the group section down the bottom. So I've got grade one P, I've got grade two B, and grade six, and you know different classes. And you can see in this grade, there's four profiles requested, and two have been received. Uh, when you click on the on the class, then the view changes and I can see those, those profiles. All right? And then over, I'll just have a look at grade 1P here. You can see there are two carers. There's Jerry and there's me. And assume that they're the, they're the teachers or maybe a, a first aid staff. Or if this was a sporting club, it, it might, these are the coaches. All right? And so the way that the teacher for example, gets access to the classes is just by checking, checking the box. So if um, I'm not allowed to see grade 3D anymore, I just uncheck that and save it. And next time I'm looking at the CareMonkey data, I don't see the kids that are in that class. So it's a really simple system uh, for the administrators and there's no paper. And they don't have to chase people up. It's completely automatic. So that's what it looks like for the administrators. Now, if I was the teacher, the beauty of this system is that there are mobile um, apps because you know, when you're filling in these forms in, in paper, they go to the school, they get filed away, and they're not accessible by people. And they're really virtually useless. But now we've got an el electronic form that the parents filled in. I can see it on the, on the phone. So I'm just going to, I've got this little magic program that can show you what's on my phone. I'll just get rid of that one. And here's the CareMonkey app. It requires every time you've got to put in your username and password because we are dealing with sensitive personal and, and medical information. And when, when I log in, it goes and checks to see what's changed since last time we logged in. And I know what's changed because I just unchecked myself for uh, class 3P. So that's just going to take a second to synchronize. And here are the profiles that I've got access to. Now these ones at the top, they're actually, these are real life profiles. Amy, Amy Wesley is my daughter. Bailey's my son. You can see there's a profile for me. Barbara Wesley, it's my mum. Okay? And if I was a teacher, these are, these are the kids in my class. Or I'm a coach and these are the kids in the team. And you can see at a very high level, I already know that there are some medical alerts amongst this group of people that I need to be aware of. For instance, Joel here, when I click on that, it tells me anaphylaxis. All right? Zoe down here, a red alert for asthma. She's got Crohn's disease and she's got epilepsy, poor thing. She's not real, by the way, she's just my demo girl. All right? <laughs> now, when I drill down on, on Zoe's profile, it now shows me the details that the parent has put into the system. So I've got Zoe's picture and I've got her contact details. 
I've got a list of emergency contacts. Now when you're filling in these forms every time, there's usually a spot for one or two emergency contacts, but what if they're not around? Here I've got six emergency contacts. I've got a dad and a mum, a grandparent, an aunt, and you are one button away from an emergency contact if you need them. So it's really, it's, it's a useful emergency form. I've got, inf I've got her medical contacts, so I can use the, the maps to see how to get there. I've got some emergency information like a blood type, do you object to transfusions? You can see Zoe actually wears glasses because that's in red saying yes. I can store Medicare details, organ donor, private health insurance, ambulance, swimming ability, last tetanus, information that's really, really useful. In medical conditions, she's a yes for asthma and a yes for fits. And when I put in yes as the parent, it popped up a window and allowed me to put in some other details. I gave it a high risk. I can actually attach her asthma plan, a scanned copy of her asthma plan, and I've put in her uh, symptoms and how to administer her medication. So everything that I'd like a carer to know, being the parent, uh, is shared with the school, it's shared with a, a club, I can share it with grandma, I can share it with family friends. Um, it's a portable, reusable uh, care profile. So that, that's probably enough to give you an idea of what it's about. Uh, but I encourage you to, um, particularly like I said, if you're interested in doing your own startup, is there anybody that works in a startup right now? No, there's a few. Is there any that would like to? A few, a few nods ahead, come on, be brave. Yeah. So uh, any, any, any questions that you'd like to ask? Yeah. Firstly, thank you. <laughs> no, no worries. Thank you. Hey, so what were your first, um, your first, so your first pitch to clients, the privacy questions that came up, so how did you deal with the obvious sort of issues around privacy? Privacy and security was, like, it obviously is really important. We, we built that into the system right from the get-go. Um, the only people that can see this information are those that the parent has given um, specific access to. It's not like Facebook, right? It's, it's health and security, that, but it's really tight. Um, you know, we've got a privacy policy, we don't share the data, you know, we've got all, all the right, we're doing all, all the right things. Yeah. Yeah. Along those lines, can you securitize it by profile, or does it have to be by grade 3, P, 1, 1B? Oh yeah, it could, it, yeah. The groups is just an easy way to manage, um, manage a group group of people. But yeah, it can be so by. For Zoe, I can specifically say I only want this teacher to have access. Yeah. And this coach. Yep. What, what was the? Um, you said you made lots and lots of mistakes. Mm. What was? What do you think? You know, one of the most critical ones that could have derailed the whole thing would have been if you. I'm trying to pick one or two. Oh no, there's too many to pick. Uh, but I'll, I'll give, I'll just give you, I'll just give you a few. Um, uh, okay. So I had this idea uh, when I was working at, I was working at Google, and I thought this was a thing that I wanted to do. But like I told you, I've got seven kids. That's a costly family. Let me, let me tell you. So I didn't, I didn't have the courage to um, live without any income. So I decided that I will, I'll, I'll quit Google and I'll go and work. Uh, three days a week as a consulting, which I did. And uh, I worked for a friend of mine and I signed a six month contract with him. And at the end of six months he said, Troy, this has been fantastic, we've got so much done, let's sign up for another six months. And I thought, I hadn't done one thing for my startup. I just got consumed again in somebody else's business. So I really had to take the courage to burn the bridges and go, all right, this is gonna cost me money, but I'm gonna give it a red hot go. So that was, that was my first, I wasted six months there. So then once I got the courage and burnt the bridge, the next day I went out and I spent $7 on a wireframing tool to start designing what CareMonkey would be. And I spent three months doing that. And I pissed around with colors and fonts and, <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously, it all got thrown away anyway, all, all of that. By the time I got an actual real designer to, to get on it, <laughs> You know, he took my original design and just then went and made his own. Right? So, so I watched another, watched another three months. Yeah. And I've got a question. So, um, you know, you've got a lot of 
Did you go through a period where you were bridging the gap between feeling unemployed and feeling like somebody who's selling business? Did you well, have kind of like an, an emotional kind of gap to get over to make you feel real? No, um, I was just determined that I was going to give it a go. And originally I said, you know, after, after a year, you know, I'm not going to lose my house after, after a year or anything. Um, but, you know, if I haven't had a good go after a year, I can always get a, go and get a job again. Well, now it's two years. All right. And um, this, in fact, this week, uh, we've just earned our first revenue. So we, we had to make sure that this product was really good because we're dealing with, you know, really sensitive information. And so we've, so we've done so many trials and we've had it um, trialling in schools and so on. But now, um, well, at the end of last week, we decided we're, we're ready to see if we can actually earn some revenue. And uh, we made some appointments this week. And the first one was on Monday, one appointment, school bought it. Uh, and then I had an appointment on uh, yesterday morning, one meeting, they bought it. And I had another appointment the same day. And um, the principal wasn't there for that meeting. So they said, look, we love it, but can you come back next week and show the principal? So it's a good start. Um, it doesn't mean we've made it yet. I mean, I've got two years of no income and there's a long way to go, but it, it, there's certainly positive signs in the first week.